vacation was approaching. The schoolmaster, always severe, grew severer and more exacting than ever, for he wanted the school to make a good showing on examination day. His rod and his ferrule were seldom idle now at least among the smaller pupils. Only the biggest boys, and young ladies of eighteen and twenty, escaped lashing. Mr. Dobbins' lashings were very vigorous ones, too, for although he carried, under his wig, a perfectly bald and shiny head, he had only reached middle age, and there was no sign of feebleness in his muscle. As the great day approached, all the tyranny that was in him came to the surface, he seemed to take a vindictive pleasure in punishing the least shortcomings. The consequence was, that the smaller boys spent their days in terror and suffering and their nights in plotting revenge. They threw away no opportunity to do the master a mischief. But he kept ahead all the time. The retribution that followed every vengeful success was so sweeping and majestic that the boys always retired from the field badly worsted. At last they conspired together and hit upon a plan that promised a dazzling victory. They swore in the sign painter's boy, told him the scheme, and asked his help. He had his own reasons for being delighted, for the master boarded in his father's family and had given the boy ample cause to hate him. The master's wife would go on a visit to the country in a few days, and there would be nothing to interfere with the plan. The master always prepared himself for great occasions by getting pretty well fuddled, and the sign painter's boy said that when the dominie had reached the proper condition on examination evening he would manage the thing while he napped in his chair, then he would have him awakened at the right time and hurried away to school. In the fullness of time the interesting occasion arrived. At eight in the evening the schoolhouse was brilliantly lighted, and adorned with wreaths and festoons of foliage and flowers. The master sat throned in his great chair upon a raised platform, with his blackboard behind him. He was looking tolerably mellow. Three rows of benches on each side and six rows in front of him were occupied by the dignitaries of the town and by the parents of the pupils. To his left, back of the rows of citizens, was a spacious temporary platform upon which were seated the scholars who were to take part in the exercises of the evening. Rows of small boys, washed and dressed to an intolerable state of discomfort. Rows of gawky big boys, snow banks. Of girls and young ladies clad in lawn and muslin and conspicuously conscious of their bare arms, their grandmother's ancient trinkets, their bits of pink and blue ribbon and the flowers in their hair. All the rest of the house was filled with non-participating scholars. The exercises began. A very little boy stood up and she pitchly recited, You'd scarce expect one of my age to speak in public on the stage, etc. Accompanying himself with the painfully exact and spasmodic gestures which a machine might have used supposing the machine to be a trifle out of order. But he got through safely, though cruelly scared, and got a fine round of applause when he made his manufactured bow and retired. A little shame-faced girl lisped, Mary had a little lamp, etc., performed a compassion-inspiring curtsy, got her me of applause, and sat down flushed and happy. Tom Sawyer stepped forward with conceited confidence and soared into the unquenchable and indestructible give me liberty or give me death speech, with fine fury and frantic gesticulation, and broke down in the middle of it. A ghastly stage fright seized him, his legs quaked under him and he was like to choke. True, he had the manifest sympathy of the house but he had the house's silence, too, which was even worse than its sympathy. The master frowned, and this completed the disaster. Tom struggled a while and then retired, utterly defeated. There was a weak attempt at applause, but it died early. The boy stood on the burning deck followed, also the Assyrian came down, and other declamatory gems. Then there were reading exercises, and a spelling fight. The meager Latin class recited with honor. 
The prime feature of the evening was in order. Now original compositions by the young ladies. Each in her turn stepped forward to the edge of the platform, cleared her throat, held up her manuscript tied with dainty ribbon and proceeded to read, with labored attention to expression and punctuation. The themes were the same that had been illuminated upon similar occasions by their mothers before them, their grandmothers, and doubtless all their ancestors in the female line clear back to the Crusades. Friendship was one memories of other days religion in history dreamland the advantages of culture forms of political government compared and contrasted melancholy filial love heart longings etc etc the prevalent feature in these compositions was of nursed and petted melancholy another was a wasteful and opulent gush of fine language another was a tendency to lug in by the ears particularly prized words and phrases until they were worn entirely out and a peculiarity that conspicuously marked and marked them was the inveterate and intolerable sermon that wagged its crippled tail at the end of each and every one of them no matter what the subject might be the brain-racking effort was made to squirm it into some aspect or other that the moral and religious mind could contemplate with edification. The glaring insincerity of these sermons was not sufficient to compass the banishment of the fashion from the schools, and it is not sufficient today, but never will be sufficient while the world stands, perhaps. There is no school in all our lands where the young ladies do not feel obliged to close their compositions with a sermon, and you will find that the sermon of the most frivolous and the least religious girl in the school is always the longest and the most relentlessly pious. But enough of this. Homely truth is unpalatable. Let us return to the examination. The first composition that was read was one entitled Is This, Then? life. Perhaps the reader can endure an extract from it, in the common walks of life. With what delightful emotions does the youthful mind look forward to some anticipated scene of festivity? Imagination is busy sketching rose-tinted pictures of joy. In fancy, the voluptuous votary of fashion sees herself amid the festive throng, the observed of all observers. Her graceful form, arrayed in snowy robes, is whirling through the mazes of the joyous dance, her eye is brightest, her step is lightest in the gay assembly. In such delicious fancies time quickly glides by, and the welcome hour arrives for her entrance into the Elysian world, of which she has had such bright dreams. How fairy-like does everything appear to her enchanted vision! Each new scene is more charming than the last, but after a while she finds that beneath this goodly exterior, all is vanity, the flattery which once charmed her soul, now grates harshly upon her ears, the ballroom has lost its charms, and with wasted health and embittered heart, she turns away with the conviction that earthly pleasures cannot satisfy the longings of the soul, and so forth and so on. There was a buzz of gratification from time to time during the reading, accompanied by whispered ejaculations of how sweet, how eloquent, so true, etc., and after the thing had closed with a peculiarly afflicting sermon the applause was enthusiastic. Then arose a slim, melancholy girl, whose face had the interesting paleness that comes of pills and indigestion, and read a poem. Two stanzas of it will do, a Missouri maiden's farewell to Alabama. Alabama, goodbye. I love thee well. But yet for a while do I leave thee now. Sad, yes, sad thoughts of thee my heart doth swell, and burning recollections throng my brow. For I have wandered through thy flowery woods, have roamed and read near Tallapoosa's stream, have listened to Tallassee's warring floods and wooed on Coos's side or Rora's beam. Yet shame I not to bear an overfull heart, nor blush to turn behind my tearful eyes. Tis from no stranger land I now must part, tis to no strangers left I yield these sighs. Welcome and home were mine within this state, 
whose veil highly whose fires fade fast from me and cold must be mine eyes and heart and tech when dear alabama they turn cold on thee there were very few there who knew what that meant but the poem was very satisfactory nevertheless next appeared the dark complexioned black-eyed black-haired young lady who paused an impressive moment assumed a tragic expression and began to read in a measured solemn tone the vision dark and tempestuous was night around the throne on high not a single star quivered but the deep intonations of the heavy thunder constantly vibrated upon the ear whilst the terrific lightning reveled in angry mood through the cloudy chambers of heaven seeming to scorn the power exerted over its terror by the illustrious franklin even the boisterous whines unanimously came forth from their mystic homes and blustered about as if to enhance by their aid the wildness of the scene at such a time so dark so dreary for human sympathy my very spirit sighed but instead there rough my dearest friend my counselor my comforter and guide my joy in grief my second bliss in joy came to my side she moved like one of those bright beings pictured in the sunny walks of fancies eaten by the romantic and young the queen of beauty unadorned save by her own transcendent loveliness so soft was her step it failed to make even the sound and but for the magical thrill imparted by her genial touch as other unobtrusive beauties she would have glided away unperceived unsought a strange sadness rested upon her features like icy tears upon the robe of december and she pointed to the contending elements without and bade me contemplate the two beings presented this nightmare occupied some ten pages of manuscript and wound up with a sermon so destructive of all hope to non-presbyterians that it took the first prize this composition was considered to be the very finest effort of the evening the mayor of the village in delivering the prize to the author of it made a warm speech in which he said that it was by far the most eloquent thing he had ever listened to and that daniel webster himself might well be proud of it it may be remarked in passing that the number of compositions in which the word beauteous was over fondled and human experience referred to as life's page was up to the usual average now the master mellow almost to the verge of geniality put his chair aside turned his back to the audience and began to draw a map of America on the blackboard, to exercise the geography class upon. But he made a sad business of it with his unsteady hand, and a smothered titter rippled over the house. He knew what the matter was, and set himself to write it. He sponged outlines and remade them, but he only distorted them more than ever, and the tittering was more pronounced. He threw his entire attention upon his work, now, as if determined not to be put down by the mirth. He felt that all eyes were fastened upon him, he imagined he was succeeding, and yet the tittering continued, it even manifestly increased. And well it might. There was a garret above, pierced with a scuttle over his head, and down through this scuttle came a cat, suspended around the haunches by a string. She had a rag tied about her head and jaws to keep her from mewing. As she slowly descended she curved upward and clawed at the string. She swung downward and clawed at the intangible air. The tittering rose higher and higher. The cat was within six inches of the absorbed teacher's head. Down, down, a little lower. And she grabbed his whip with her desperate claws. Clung to it and was snatched up into the garret in an instant with her trophy still in her possession. And how the light did blaze abroad from the master's bald pate for the sign painter's boy had gilded it. That broke up the meeting. The boys were avenged. Vacation had come. Note colon the pretended compositions quoted in this chapter are taken without alteration from a volume entitled Prose and Poetry by a western lady but they are exactly and precisely after the schoolgirl pattern, and hence are much happier than any mere imitations could be. 
Tom joined a new order of cadets of temperance, being attracted by the showy character of their regalia. He promised to abstain from smoking, chewing, and profanity as long as he remained a member. Now he found out a new thing namely, that to promise not to do a thing is the surest way in the world to make a body want to go and do that very thing. Tom soon found himself tormented with a desire to drink and swear. The desire grew to be so intense that nothing but the hope of a chance to display himself in his red sash kept him from withdrawing from the order. Fourth of July was coming, but he soon gave it up gave it up before he had worn his shackles over for eight hours and fixed his hopes upon old Judge Fraser, Justice of the Peace, who was apparently on his deathbed and would have a big public funeral, since he was so high and official. During three days Tom was deeply concerned about the judge's condition and hungry for news of it. Sometimes his hopes ran high so high that he would venture to get out his regalia and practice before the looking glass. But the judge had a most discouraging way of fluctuating. At last he was pronounced upon the men and then convalescent. Tom was disgusted, and felt a sense of injury, too. He handed in his resignation at once and that night the judge suffered a relapse and died. Tom resolved that he would never trust a man like that again. The funeral was a fine thing. The cadets paraded in a style calculated to kill the late member with envy. Tom was a free boy again, however there was something in that. He could drink and swear now but found to his surprise that he did not want to. The simple fact that he could, took the desire away, and the charm of it. Tom presently wondered to find that his coveted vacation was beginning to hang a little heavily on his hands. He attempted a diary but nothing happened during three days, and so he abandoned it. The first of all the Negro minstrel shows came to town, and made a sensation. Tom and Joe Harper got up a band of performers and were happy for two days. Even the glorious fourth was in some sense a failure, for it rained hard, there was no procession in consequence, and the greatest man in the world as Tom supposed Mr. Benton, an actual United States Senator, proved an overwhelming disappointment for he was not twenty-five feet high, nor even anywhere in the neighborhood of it. The circus came. The boys played circus for three days afterward in tents made of rag carpeting of mission, three pins for boys, two for girls and then circusing was abandoned. A phrenologist and a mesmerizer came and went again and left the village duller and drearier than ever. There were some boys and girls parties, but they were so few and so delightful that they only made the aching voids between ache the harder. Becky Thatcher was gone to her Constantinople home to stay with her parents during vacation so there was no bright side to life anywhere. The dreadful secret of the murder was a chronic misery. It was a very cancer for permanency and pain. Then came the measles. During two long weeks Tom lay a prisoner, dead to the world and its happenings. He was very ill, he was interested in nothing. When he got upon his feet at last and moved feebly downtown, the melancholy change had come over everything and every creature. There had been a revival, and everybody had got religion, not only the adults, but even the boys and girls. Tom went about, hoping against hope for the sight of one blessed sinful face, but disappointment crossed him everywhere. He found Joe Harper studying a testament and turned sadly away from the depressing spectacle. He sought Ben Rogers, and found him visiting the poor with a basket of tracts. He hunted up Jim Hollis, who called his attention to the precious blessing of his late measles as a warning. Every boy he encountered added another ton to his depression, and when, in desperation, he flew for refuge at last to the bosom of Huckleberry Finn and was received with a scriptural quotation. His heart broke and he crept home and to bed realizing that he alone of all the 
town was lost, forever and forever. And that night there came on a terrific storm, with driving rain, awful claps of thunder and blinding sheets of lightning. He covered his head with the bedclothes and waited in a horror of suspense for his doom, for he had not the shadow of a doubt that all this hubbub was about him. He believed he had taxed the forbearance of the powers above to the extremity of endurance and that this was the result. It might have seemed to him the waste of pomp and ammunition to kill a bug with a battery of artillery, but there seemed nothing incongruous about the getting up such an expensive thunderstorm as this to knock the turf from under an insect like himself. By and by the tempest spent itself and died without accomplishing its object. The boy's first impulse was to be grateful, and reform. His second was to wait for there might not be any more storms. The next day the doctors were back. Tom had relapsed. The three weeks he spent on his back this time seemed an entire age. When he got abroad at last he was hardly grateful that he had been spared, remembering how lonely was his estate, how companionless and forlorn he was. He drifted listlessly down the street and found Jim Holly acting as judge in a juvenile court that was trying a cat for murder, in the presence of her victim, a bird. He found Joe Harper and Huck Finn up an alley eating a stolen melon. Poor lads. They like Tom had suffered a relapse 